Oh my goodness, it just said we are live and I'm Holy here with my buddy. How's it going? <laughs> it's going good, man. I, you know, it's always a little bit like walking a tightrope without the uh, the net underneath, but I'm excited to do this. Yeah, so we have Ramon Oso, uh, Osa from uh, Osa Tennis 360 and that we're going to- that, that was my Italian name, Oso. Osa is. <laughs> <laughs> Osa is the real name. Yeah, for yeah. sure. My grandma always said, by the way, that all my good qualities are the Italian qualities and the bad ones are the Spanish ones. I don't know if that's is, true or not, but is, that's what is, she always said. Is that what she says? Now, I got a question for you. When you have spaghetti, is, yeah. it, is it sauce or is it gravy? What's oh, the, it's sauce. It's sauce? Sauce. Really? sauce really? Yeah. If it's not sauce, it's not Italian. Wait, no, dude. All right. I think, you know, I might have caught you. I, I, from what I understand, the Italians in New Jersey, when they're going to feed you a nice Italian dish and they, you got spaghetti with, with tomato sauce, they don't say it's tomato sauce. It's tomato sauce, but they call it gravy. You've never heard this? That, that's like East Coast and West Coast swing, I think. Oh. Because over here on the West Coast, it's, it's sauce. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> oh, okay. Don't, don't you think, though, East Coast Italians are more Italian than West Coast Italians? Uh, I guess it depends which direction they came over from, right? If they came over from the West or the East. Oh, come on. When you think of Italians, you think of New York. You okay, now New here's, York and New Jersey. Come here's on. The real, here's the real question: meatball or meat sauce? This will this will test to see where you where your Italian uh, knowledge comes from. Well, I, I like the meatball. I like the meatball, and uh, they do they do offer tomato sauce or meat sauce. I usually go with a tomato sauce. We got Diego on here. Diego says he's playing a big tournament next weekend in Monterey, Mexico. Dude, wow. awesome, Diego. That's awesome, man. Really went well sponsored really fun uh, playing that tournament perfect timing for this video oh my goodness that's awesome that's Dude, awesome. I, then with that i think we should uh we should probably dive in right we should dive in so we've got we've got a bunch of people on the call already which is exciting so everybody who's popping on in we're uh excited to have you if you don't know who we are well why are you here no i'm just kidding no it's, it's uh it's it's uh peter freeman from crunch time coaching and we got uh, Ra Ramon, Ram I, I get confused on how yeah, exactly you, say your name. You got Ra it on the tip Ramon, the right? Yeah, Ramon. Ramon. Osa. Yep. Ramon. Ramon Osa from Osa Tennis Three Hundred and Sixty. And my buddy, I have been following for a while. And what I always love about his videos is that they're very edu edutainment, right? Is uh, it's like <laughs> educational and it, entertaining. They're educated. Is the way I like to put it. Yeah, you know, we, I, I, I spent at least three years in eighth grade to do this. So <laughs> I, I, I really enjoy watching them. You know, you're going to give a great tip. The, the information is always good. You know, sometimes there's a dog in the video. There's there's statues in the video. There's uh, sometimes you're driving your car to the courts. Like I like that stuff. I think that's good. So, oh cool, man, awesome! We'll keep doing it. So keep up, <laughs> Thank keep you. Up, keep up the great work. And today is definitely a good topic because. You know, the forehand, you put that serve in play, and then especially, you know, the forehand, if you're good at it, can be such a dominating factor. But it can also let you down because you can make so many mistakes because uh, you're trying sometimes to be more aggressive than maybe you're comfortable with. So we're covering today are five mistakes you're probably making on your forehand. You're probably doing this if you're on this call is what he's saying. Hell, we're probably doing it half of the time. Oh, That's I make, why we're doing this. I make way too many mistakes. It drives me nuts. And – what to do instead. So five mistakes you're probably making on your forehand and what you should be doing. So this is going to be exciting. So we're going to kind of dive right into it. We do have a chat off to the side of this video. Definitely come on in, say hello, say where you're from, and we're going to be accepting questions. We're, we'll, we'll, maybe sometimes we'll chime in, we'll have a question come on in, and we'll kind of interrupt what we're doing. But definitely at the end, we're going to leave some time to get to some good stuff. So uh, pleasure having you here, buddy. Is there anything you'd like to say before we start? Dude, it's it's a pleasure being here. And and I love doing these live calls because I want to hear, you know, what your questions are. You know, what what are the things that that are frustrating you with your forehand? You know, I know for me, I'm going to get into a lot of this. And, you know, Pete's going to share some of the stuff that he's doing and that 
you know, sometimes we, we get so into what we're doing and we can't see the big picture. So, uh, you know, I definitely want to hear your questions, hear your experiences, but we got a ton of great stuff to share and I'm excited to, to do this. Very, very cool. Now, we started, if you are on my email list, we started, we, he, he gave out a, a free training series. He's, he's, if you're on his list right now, you're going through a free training series. And uh, I just want to know, uh, can people still get into this? Uh, is it too late to get some free training from you on the floor? Well, we, we closed the doors yesterday. But <laughs> since you're at home uh, and you're listening to this call, if you want to get the free training, we'll open it up for you. Absolutely. It's, uh, you can get your free perfect forehand checklist. And we'll talk about this again at the end. And I got some really good training videos that's going to help you make the easy forehand every time. And you can get that at osatennis360.com backslash crunch time in honor of my buddy, uh, Pete. All right. Very, very cool. So let's not beat up around the bush. You got five mistakes that people are making. So I guess the best place to start with, it's kind of like a, you know, a top five list usually start backwards and then the excitement builds to the number one mistake that people are making. So let's, let's start with number five. What's the, what's number five on the list? Okay. So this is probably the least sexy of the five. Okay. I wanted to say that because we're going to build up to number one, but the, the number one or the number five problem is people aren't training progressively. Okay. And what I mean by that is most people, when they go out to play, and I, I do this a lot because tennis is fun and I love playing tennis. We just want to go out and we want to hit the ball around, right? And it's, it's fun to hit the ball around. You get a great workout in. But unless you have a plan um, to progressively improve your strokes, you're probably not going to improve as much as if you actually raised the ceiling of your technique. Because technique isn't everything. I mean, you could look at John McEnroe and the guy won how many grand slams. And he had pretty atrocious technique, but it's it's certainly something that can raise the ceiling of your game by improving those technical areas of your game. And I know I said this is the least sexy of the few, but this leads to more power, more spin, better efficiency, fewer mishits, and all the stuff that is really sexy. So um, you got to improve your ability to consistently get to the ideal point of contact. And... That, that is everything. You know, everything that you have, if you have the greatest racket lag in the world, if you have the silkiest follow through, if you grunt like a horse, <laughs> you know, all that stuff is great. But unless you can consistently get to that point of contact, none of that matters, right? That's, that's what determines what the ball is ultimately going to do. So we have to be able to do that. And the way we can do that most efficiently, where you can improve the quickest, is using progressions. All right, and what a progression is, is kind of coach speak for basically taking one small skill, mastering that one small skill, and then moving on to a slightly more challenging skill or the next logical step in that skill. So an example of a, a progression I use all the time would be, can you just go out and catch the ball? Okay, and there's a lot kind of going on there because you're tracking the ball, you're moving smoothly, you're not thinking about where's my racket position here. You're just keeping your hands in front of your body, which is an important part of creating the coil. And then from there, you do that about, I don't know, 10 or 20 times. And then you go out and can I bunt the ball? Can I just go out and tap the ball in the center of the strings? Can I hit the sweet spot? Then from there, you could do some shadow swings. Okay, so you've had your coach. You've seen me and Pete talk about the ideal forehand swing. Can you just shadow that movement? Okay, then, uh, or shadow that swing, then you would shadow the movement. Right. So then you would go out and pretend that you're going to go hit the ball. You would use some footwork pattern. You'd go out and you'd hit the ball. And then finally, we would introduce a ball either in a hand feed or a racket feed or, or a rally or the wall. So that's one example of a progression that you can use to um, systematically stack skills on top of skills um, that never overwhelms you. Very so, cool. Can, can I can I hop in on that for a little bit? Because yeah, you, dude, for sure. you've, hit, you've hit on some good points, and I want everybody to really listen closely to what he's saying. Because if you're just kind of hearing, it, you might be going, "Yeah, yeah," but I'm past that point. I'm a three-five. I'm a four. I'm a four-five player. You know, I, I know how to hit a tennis ball. But you might be going, "I do have a problem on my forehand. I know there's something in there that that's not right." And you see, that's where everything that you're saying is so important because 
to get rid of a problem, most people are not willing to go back and do the little things. Like you said, it's not, it's not sexy. The pros will actually go back and do these types of exercises. If you ever look up the pros working out, they're doing lots of these skills broken down into steps so that their whole stroke flows into a thing of beauty. And what most recreational players do once they get to a certain proficiency in their game, where it's three, five, or four, or whatever, and they have a bad week or a bad month, or they feel like there's something wrong with their foray, and they think, well, I'm just going to go out and just crush balls on the ball machine, or give have my coach give me another lesson. We're going to hit cross courts till I get that thing grooved. And as long as that deficiency is within your stroke, it's just not going to improve. Even if you go out there and you you have a good hitting day with a coach or a buddy, if, if there's still something fundamentally wrong with your stroke, it's not going to get better until you go through these step-by-step -step progressions and make sure the whole thing works perfectly. So what you just said is very powerful and not necessarily just for beginners. Absolutely, man. And I would add to that, when you're, when you're doing these progressions, give yourself the permission to miss. Because what you're doing is you're not worried about if you're making the shot or not. Ultimately, we want to make a lot of shots. But what you're trying to do is you're trying to improve a facet of your technique. And that may or may not result in making more shots. See, I see a lot of people, they come in and they say, you know, we're in a progression. And they did the thing perfectly. Maybe we're working on having a balanced finish or whatever it might be. But they said, yeah, but I missed the shot, Ramon. But that's not the point, right? That what we're doing is giving you all the pieces. Like a car wouldn't just run with just an engine, right? A car wouldn't just run with a gas pedal. You need the whole thing working together. But in order to put it together, you have to put those pieces together so that, as you said, Pete, it all works as one silky smooth gazelle-like shot. <laughs> Very cool. Now, before we go to number four, I think those are great points. We have a couple comments in here. So I'm just going to... Um, read a couple off, ask you a question. Then I also do have a little, I, I have something where I can help somebody too that I, I see here. So first question I'm going to ask you is from Alan Miller. And he says, does the swing start with the hip turn? Oh, that's a great question. And I'm going to get to this uh, later, Alan. So really it's, it, to me, it helps to not even think about the stroke is stopping and starting. And that sounds a little bit weird, but if you look at the best players in the world, what they're really doing is and they're in a continuous state of motion. So to me, I guess if we were going to choose one point, it would start with the split step, right? Because the split step is going to be kind of your, your check-in point to see where the ball's coming and what side you're actually going to hit to. And then from there, yeah, the, the hip turn or the unit turn is the first thing uh, that you want to do. But we really want to get away from thinking of the stroke as stopping and starting and really start to think of it more as a continuous um, um, thing <laughs> that we do. All right. Very cool. And then Daisy, she says that she gets in the unit turn and and um, and a single handed back on a single handed backhand, but we're talking on the forehand and the single handed backhand, but she fails to drop the racket head coming through she's more of a flat plane rather than the nice C shape. Um, before uh, we get an answer from our buddy here, I also do want to tell you, just check out my latest video on the stinky shoe, and that should help you a lot, Daisy. Um, what's your thought on that? Uh, you know, it depends. If you're trying to hit topspin, Daisy, then you do want to have that nice C shape, and you want to be able to come under the ball and hit with topspin. Um, and there's a number of ways to do that. And it's probably all in Pete's video. So I'll just have you go check that video out. But um, yeah, you want to first, one of the biggest problems that I see when people aren't getting under the ball is they're gripping the racket too tightly. And what that does is it eliminates the ability for that drop to go into the hit. Mm -hmm. So I would check that. And then also um, using your legs. You know, we think that the stroke is with our hands, but if we think about really using your legs, bending your knees, and then coming up as we hit, that's kind of a, an automatic way to get more, uh, more top spin on your shots. All right, very cool. So let's go to number four. Cool. All right, so this is going to sound totally uh, paradoxical <laughs> to what we just said, but we tend to overcomplicate stuff. 
Okay. And, um, you know, this is my whole kind of philosophy on tennis is to kiss, you know, keep it simple, silly <laughs> or stupid, right? We want to keep it as simple as possible. And the strokes are by definition at the highest level, a little more complex, but that doesn't mean we have to think about it in these complicated terms. So stop me if you've heard this before. You're in a rally, you're hitting with somebody, right? And you miss a shot and you say, oh, you know, I remember my coach told me, you know, I, I wasn't keeping my head still through the shot. So you say, okay, so we're going to start hitting again and you miss another shot. And this time the ball goes off the frame of your racket and you say, okay, so I got to make sure that I'm keeping my head still and I'm, and I'm hitting the sweet spot of the racket. Got it. Okay. The next thing you know, you're, you're too close to the ball. You get jammed on the shot. So now in the next rep, you're saying, okay, well, I got to make sure I'm far enough from the ball. I'm keeping my head still I'm sh and, I'm, and I'm hitting the ball in the center of the racket. Okay, now I got to make sure that you know, I'm relaxed because if I'm not relaxed and you're off to the races, right? And pretty soon you're, <laughs> your partner stops. She says, dude, are you okay? You know, and, and you, know, you look like you're about to have a heart attack because you have nine things that are going on inside your head at any given moment. So what you want to do is, and I do this sometimes too when I'm working on technical stuff, um, but you want to have kind of two segments of your training. One, you want to have what I call progressive overload during practice. And that's the progressions we're talking about where you're mastering one skill, getting one skill really good, and then adding one or max two more skills to that. And so we're stretching those neuro, uh, the, the motor neurons in your brain to do more stuff. That's the overload. Okay, there's a point of diminishing return with that where you, we're just thinking too much. But then we also want to spend some time in awareness, okay? Because when you talk about being in the zone, all that is is being at one with the ball, being at one with the rally, and really eliminating all of that technical stuff, okay? And a great way to do that, and I learned this from my buddy Sterling Struther, who is, who is doing some really phenomenal work, is a thing that he calls ball player. So next time you're hitting with a buddy, if, assuming you've done the technical work, right, we're going to get into a, a little drill that you can do that'll keep you in the moment and it'll keep that critical mind out of the picture, right? Keep that committee out. And it's called ball player. So when you hit the ball, you're going to immediately say out loud or to yourself player so that your attention shifts to your opponent. Because what most people do is they just focus on the ball the whole time and they're not getting the feedback from what the player that they're playing is doing which is going to give them the ability to anticipate and to react quicker. So you're going to shift your focus to the player. And in the minute that the player hits the ball, your opponent hits the ball, you're going to say the word ball and your attention is going to shift to the ball. So what this does is it not only does it keep your attention moving between the two things that are going to give you the ability to be in better position and hit better shots, but it's just going to keep you in the moment more and it's going to eliminate all of that tension and and uh you know bad stuff so that's that's a great way to do that and uh the last thing i would say is just use visualization a lot so people say well i can't visualize but if i asked you to take a bite of a lemon in your head right now and really think about it you'd probably start to salivate and you'd probably start to think oh that's really bitter so you have the ability to visualize or if i asked you what color is your door you have to visualize in order to do that so visualize yourself in the end result, the, 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 the final product of what you want your strokes to look like. And you can look at that. I could talk about this for hours, but you could look at yourself from the third person. So you're actually watching yourself perform the act. So you can see yourself kind of doing Federer's moves. And then you can visualize yourself in your own body doing the moves. And that has been proven by science that um, your subconscious mind does not know the difference between what's real and what's vividly imagined. So you're actually training your motor neurons to do the thing. And that's right out of uh, Inner Game of Tennis. And he talks about self one and self two and the power of just um, patiently and re relaxedly <laughs> observing um, someone really good at doing something. It, it speeds up the learning process. That was awesome. I mean, really, that was really good because as you were saying so many things, I, I had 
so many things running through my head. Like the the player and the ball thing is genius. I'm going to use that if it if we don't get rained out today. I'm using that today because so many times I am giving a lesson and I'm sure you have the same thing happen to where you're in a certain position with your body that you think is obvious from playing and coaching so long that your students should see. And then maybe you hit a shot that's like floating and they get to the ball on two bounces somehow. And, or you hit the ball with slice and then they're completely shocked that the ball skidded on the court. And you, I will ask uh, players and, and this is, and I'm talking about a lot of three, five, four Oh players that I coach. You know, when did you notice that the ball had spin on it? Or when did you see that the ball was going to go short and they basically say, well, right when I was getting ready to hit or right when the ball bounced on their side. And since we're so, especially a lot of people who play, we love the technique. We love to focus on the technique of tennis, but what's happening across the net, lots of times we're not even thinking about that until it's our turn to hit the ball again. So we're thinking about what's our next stroke going to look like. And your idea of hitting a ball and then think player right away and focus on, okay, now what's the player doing is genius because if people are really listening to what you're saying, that's going to go a long way in their game. The other thing that is super powerful, and it kind of gave me a flashback to as a kid, you um, mentioned that, you know, McEnroe had a horrible strokes. If I had to do, if I had to do it all over again, I would have uh, copied Lendl. I would have because, you know, he had more of the modern game uh, but when I was growing up as a kid, I loved McEnroe. And I'm telling you, I was so into tennis. And I can remember even walking to the lunch room. I would, I would walk like him and pretend I was him. And every stroke, I would try and feel like him. And I think that that got me to a pretty high level uh, early on in my tennis because I wasn't me playing. I was, I was acting out a character. And, and I had these feelings in my body. And I think that I did a pretty good job of it at an early age. So that allowed me to to, to, to do a lot of right things without thinking it so much. Cause I was just like a kid kind of playing a character. So what you just said is, is very, very good. Would you like to add anything onto that before we go to number three? Yeah, I think that's, that's awesome. By the way, man, I think having heroes is one of the most important things that you can do is find the player that is, you know, you're not going to copy Evo Karlovic if you're five foot 10, right. And you're, you're probably not going to really even copy Del Potro, because they're just their games are so different, but we're not six four. But find the guy that is most like you and most like the style of play that you want to use, and then watch him and see what you can pick up on. Like Pete was talking about John McEnroe, and that was his hero and who he emulated, and it and it really helped his game. So I think that can help you. Um, and one more thing before we go on, I just want to say that um, I was not a natural athlete. I was not a kid who was playing a lot of sports. I was 50 pounds overweight at 16 with not an athletic bone in my body. And um, the fact that I could actually go and learn these skills when I, when I couldn't even, you know, hit a ball with a, with a frying pan um, means that you can absolutely pick up these skills and, and work on them and practice them and improve. Because we know um, from science that we develop neuro, neurogenesis, I think, Sounds good anyway. <laughs> Neurogenesis happens until the day we die. So you can always build those muscle uh, connections um, for the rest of your life. So might as well do it. Very, very cool. Well, this is great stuff so far. So I'm looking forward to what is our third biggest mistake that we're probably doing on our forehand and how do we fix that? Okay, cool. So this is the one that everybody I know can relate to, including me and Pete, and that's positioning. Okay, so how what is our relationship between us and the ball? I've I've found you know coaching mostly three five and four zero players and even kids that we tend to get too close to the ball, and it's because we have this kind of innate thing that we see ball, we move to ball, we catch ball. But in tennis, it's got to be a little bit different, right? Because we've got this super weird long extension of our arm, so we actually have to get away from the ball. And so what most players do is either they T-Rex it and they get too close, which chokes off the power, it chokes off um, the ability to hit with spin, or they, if they're a little bit too late getting to the ball, they're totally off balance. And, um, you know, we kind of joke about this as coaches. We always say, 
we're always looking for that one one trick that'll give your forehand 30 more miles per hour and massive topspin. But what if I told you that 80% of the success of your stroke has nothing to do with your stroke at all, but it has to do with your position to the ball and your balance. If you do those two things, if you're in a good position to hit the ball, and we'll define that in a second, and you're on balance, meaning you can hit the ball without falling over, you've got a really, really solid foundation for hitting a lot of forehands um, consistently, accurately, and powerfully. So what do we mean by good position? So to me, we always go back to the point of contact, right? What, what is our relationship with the racket to the ball and our point of contact? And um, if you've been following my channel for any amount of time, you know that I'm, I'm a big proponent of making contact on the 45 degree angle to the court, every shot. Okay, and, and some coaches might be different. Pete, you might be different in your philosophy. I think that's the ideal point of contact, and I won't go into why with all the physics and stuff. But we need to be at the 45-degree angle into the court. We have to have good extension from our body. We don't have to have a fully extended arm like Federer and Nadal, but we have to be in that kind of range of acceptability where we're not chicken-winging it and we're not you know, locked out, but kind of in that sweet spot. And we need to be in the center of the racket and we need to be in our strike zone. So, so probably somewhere between your knees and your shoulder based on where you feel comfortable hitting the ball and where uh, what your grip is is going to influence that too. So um, actually, and this is one of the harder things to teach without actually being on the court with someone. But I do have a drill that if you're on my email list, I'm going to be sending out tomorrow that kind of walks you through a way that you can do that. Um, and, um, and I'll be happy to, to send that to you. So if you're not on my list yet, make sure you sign up osatennis360.com backslash crunch time and you'll get that video automatically. Very cool. That is great stuff again uh, because you're, you're absolutely right. You always think, well, running to a ball is harder because you have to run and then stop and then set up. And, and for some people it is, but they're so – the majority of my students probably make the most mistakes, oddly enough, is when the ball is hit directly to them okay? because they are seeing like, oh, this is an easy ball. And then they don't do the spacing things that you're talking about. And then you got the whole T-Rex and, and all that kind of stuff happening, just like you described it. So, you know, paying attention to the spacing even if you don't have perfect technique, but all of a sudden you can develop that perfect spacing habit is going to be huge for your game uh, because we always want to work on getting better technique, but there might every now and then be a flaw with our stroke, or we might end up just, you know, deciding to have a little bit of a flaw in our technique. But, you know, as long as we do certain things right, um, you know, we're going to hit a pretty good ball. Like even watching uh, Tiafo hit the ball who just beat, um, Shop of all. That's kind of interesting. You have like the beautiful style of Tiaf uh, um, of Shop of Olive, right? Did I say did I mess, mess them both? I, I butcher his name every time. But Shop <laughs> of no. Olive, you know, people love to watch him. He might be like the lefty fetter. He's so entertained to watch and he's very graceful and artistic. And then watching Tiafu for me, and I'm sure I'm not saying his name right. We'll just call uh, I was joking Francis, with Matt. Matt I was joking with Matt from Coffee Break Tennis. We'll say we'll call him Tofu, but um, <laughs> I like he's always, he's always good with the nicknames. But I mean, that guy. When I was watching him, I'm going, his stroke just looks weird to me. It does, I, I can't pinpoint what's wrong necessarily technically because when he's hitting the ball, he's hitting the ball well. He's competing at an extremely high level. It's just not aesthetically pleasing, but he does a number of things right, obviously, to where you can pound the ball and pound it consistently in. To beat the best players in the world. So, and by the uh, way, Pete, just point to well said. In, there's a there's a difference between style and technique, and yes. and style is kind of the aesthetics of it. Like Federer has a certain style, Nadal has a certain style, uh, Tofu has a certain style. But the technical parts and the three key positions that I talk about a lot are all the same. Okay, and and they get into those three key positions consistently. So, so that's why, you know, the progressions are so powerful. And uh, if you do that, uh, you, if you're on balance and you're in position, you'll be a star by Tuesday. Very cool. Star by Tuesday. I love it. So we're up to number two. Before we go to number two, first of all, I do want to thank uh, you for coming on today and giving your time 
for everybody just to kind of for the game. And it's just a goodwill thing to do. And I think it's awesome. I love these interviews. And I love that we have 10 likes on our video because then that means that YouTube is gonna go, oh, these guys are doing something that people like and they'll share this tennis information with, with other people out there. So if you're on right now and if you could find the like button, like this video, maybe share it with a friend if you could too. Uh, definitely subscribe to my channel and to OSA Tennis 360 as well because that helps grow the game and helps more and more people get educated. So uh, thank you so much for that. And let's go into number two. What is reason number two that All they're right. missing the ball? You almost knew this one was coming, right? And we're saving the big papa for last, but number two is timing. Okay, and this is the hardest thing in tennis to get. And it's, it's understandable. If you're having trouble with timing, it's not your fault. It's a, it's a process that we all have to go through, okay? Because there's a short list of about 74 things that need to happen in order for, act, for us to actually get to the point of contact on time. And um, most people, like I said, are late on contact. And this has to do with the lack of anticipation, the lack of reading and tracking. And that's why that ball player thing is so powerful and that you should use that immediately. Um, so they're behind that 45 degree angle at contact, which makes them lose power, makes them lose accuracy, you lose spin, and uh, it's not fun for the whole family, right? So what we need to do is we need to have a way to time our strokes. And the first kind of big concept that I'm going to say is what we mentioned earlier um, with, with Alan's question, which is don't think of the stroke as, I'm, okay, I'm starting my forehand now and I'm stopping my forehand, but start to think about it more as a, a point in time in a continuous process. So one of, the, one of the most powerful ways to do that if you're not already doing it is using the split step. And people say, you know, they tell me, oh yeah, I know, I know about the split step, but are you doing the split step, <laughs> right? I know that it's probably not a good idea to drink four beers on a Friday night, but sometimes I do it anyway, right? And it's, you gotta know when, um, when you're doing that and when you're not. So the split step is key because it gives you a chance to gather your balance and then react in a dynamic way. Um, so that's, that's number one, I would say, make sure that you're doing your split step. Number two is, and I learned this from Jorge Capistani, I think is his name. And he's a great coach who's got amazing content. And he says, count the number of steps that you're taking in between shots. So forget about footwork patterns and how you're moving, but just count the number of steps after you make contact with the ball in, in before you hit the next ball. And what he said was the pros are in that kind of 12 to 14 range. The high level college players are in the 10 to 12 range. High performance juniors are eight to 10. And uh, my buddy Bill at the park is probably in that three to four range. So just by being aware of how many steps that you're taking is going to, as a byproduct, is gonna improve your timing because you'll probably be in better position and you'll probably um, be in a more advantageous position to actually hit the ball. Um, and let's see, I had one more thing. Oh yeah. So this is a great one to kind of get the timing and I call it mirroring the, the fly to the ball. So this doesn't always work. It sometimes if you get a really high lob, this won't work. But if you imagine that your hands are always going to be on the level of the ball, um, it, this really helps. So do this, get a ball. Next time you're out at the court, grab a ball, and what I want you to do is I want you to toss the ball up like a mini serve toss, and if you have a loop, this works better. So if you have a loop on your forehand, you toss the ball up, and imagine that as the ball is going up, so the left hand, if my left hand's acting as the ball, the left hand's going up like the ball, and now I'm starting the loop with my right hand. As the ball falls, my right hand is starting to fall, and as they, they go up together, they drop together, then as the ball bounces, my hand, my right hand is coming up to meet the ball. So that, that's a great way to improve the timing is to mirror the flight of the ball with your hands. And, and on, a, on a kind of a regular topspin shot that you're receiving, this works really well. If you're way back behind the baseline, the timing is going to be slightly different because the ball is going to be on the way down when you hit it. Um, but that's kind of a good jumping off point to, to get your timing. Because at the end of the day, Pete and I could teach you the perfect forehand stroke in about five minutes, right? I can, I can give you the mechanics to hit a perfect forehand. That's not the hard part. The hard part is learning how to 
negotiate the time space thing, reading the ball, you know, and, and knowing what the ball is going to do and anticipating what your opponent might do so that, you know, you can, you can start that process sooner and, and kind of smooth out those edges. And that's why those, those progressions that we talked about are so powerful. Pete, you know, what do you think about this? I'm curious. I, I think that's all really, really good stuff. I, I love the uh, Jorge Capistani tips about the steps and counting the steps. I think that's great. I do want to put a disclaimer out there. I think what you want to do is do that in your practices and not in your matches because, like we were talking about, overwhelm of thoughts. You know, that's a drill that you do to kind of see where you're at. Knowing you're playing a match, you don't want it with all the other pressure. You don't want to be going, okay, one, two, three, four, five. You know, that's that's too much. But it is a yeah. great great drill to do when when you're trying to see where you're at. I think that's something every single body, every person watching this should do. The other thing on timing, I'll just give you one other tip to just kind of think about is People tend to start their swing a lot when they see the ball pretty much there at the destination. And that, that's what makes them late. And what you want to start to, it's going to be something that you think about and will take you a while to get the skill. Just kind of like why do uh, quarterbacks and wide receivers get together even in off season and spring training? I saw Tom Brady, he went to like a retreat and he brought in his wide receivers because Knowing the timing of the routes is so important because Tom Brady can't throw the ball when he sees his, uh, you know, his wide receiver get to the spot. He's got to throw the ball be before that a per person's even near that spot where, where the person's going to catch it. And because it's a motion sport, just like tennis. So they have to work together and know, okay, well, when Tom starts to throw this way, by the time he throws it that way and rifles it at a certain pace, that I'm going to be there. So they work on that timing over and over again. And it's the same thing with tennis balls. Balls are coming at all kinds of different paces and spins. And you got to figure out when you need to start the motion and bring it forward. So by the time the ball is there, your racket and the ball are colliding in perfect time. Time, And it, it, you can't start this all when the ball is there. Because by the time your brain goes, oh, here's the ball, start the swing, the ball's already gone by you. So percent, hundred percent. And what I would add on to that is with the split step coming out of the split step, the, the reason you want to work with that and really, really make sure that's part of your game is because if you watch the best players, they're not actually landing with both feet on the ground at the same time. What they're doing is they, they know in the middle of their split step that that ball is going to come to their forehand, for example. So if you're a righty, your left foot is actually going to hit slightly in front of the right foot and it's going to begin that process. So knowing as soon as the ball, as soon as you come out of your split, that's a forehand. That's going to help you begin that movement like Pete was saying. You don't want to wait until the ball is on your side of the court and say, you know what, I think I'm going to hit a backhand on this. You don't want to do that. You know, make sure that you're, you're making that decision as quickly as possible. One thing that's cool, we got Rafa Nadal on, on the uh, chat. Which is kind Dude, of, Rafa, Rafa Nadal is here. He pulls, uh, it's he amazing. Out, he pulls out of Mexico. He's got nothing to do. He's like, I better work on my forehand. So thank you, well, Rafa, for joining Rafa, us. Rafa, I've been meaning to talk to you about your forehand. It's good, but we got some work to do on it. But yeah, welcome to the call. <laughs> you're, you're late. You're a little late on your forehand. Um, okay. Let's go to number one. Number one. Drum roll, please. And you know what it is. Everyone wants more power on their ground strokes, right? That's the thing that people know that if I could just get a little more power and, and we could talk about this, but what they're trying to do is they're trying to create power by swinging harder. And I know that I fall into this trap sometimes. Like if I'm hitting with a buddy and we're just having a hell of a time and we're whacking the ball around and it, it becomes like this ego thing that we want to hit the ball harder. We just swing harder and harder. And what ends up happening is we end up tensing our muscles and we start not using the body in the way that's actually optimum to create power. And um, that's why you see these long, skinny kids that are hitting the ball 100 miles an hour because they understand that power in tennis is created through elastic strength and not through contractile strength, not through brute force. So the bench press isn't necessarily going to help you hit the ball harder, but being able to pre-stretch your muscles and release those muscles in the right sequence will. So um, the, the way that I like to think about it is uh, kind of loading your body. It's like, it's like pushing down a spring. Okay, The more you push down that spring, 
the more it's going to it's going to explode up into the ground and your body when you're talking about tennis acts in a lot of the same way so what we want to do is really we want to put our muscles on stretch and and what we want to do is really try and turn away from the ball as much as possible as much as is comfortable and then release that ball uh, release that tension at the right time um, in the loosest most efficient way possible so in order to do that the first thing we have to do is make sure that we're not gripping the racket like a vice right that we're not grabbing the racket and, and a great way to kind of check that is when next time you're hitting with a buddy and you guys are practicing just on each shot with no judgment but just with each shot think about on a scale of one to ten one being super 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 loose like a spaghetti noodle that's been cooked and a ten which is like vice death death grip what was your grip tension you know in in the swing you know on average if you had to give it a number what would it be so what that'll instantly do is it'll make you aware of how how tightly you're holding the racket and what we really want to do what me and pete really want to do is give you an awareness so that you can be on the court and you can start to be self-correcting because that's that's ultimately what's going to take you to the next level is to be able to notice what just what the hell just happened right and what just went wrong so notice how tightly you're holding the racket first okay then the second thing is that you want to you want to understand the stroke mechanics okay you want to understand the, the most efficient way to hit the tennis ball from a forehand perspective. And this isn't really my opinion. It's not Pete's opinion. This is just biomechanics. This is just physics. Okay, the more that we can pre-stretch the muscle, the more forcefully we can contract that muscle. Okay, you hear about it, like a guy I follow named Jeff Cavalier over at athlenext.com. And if you're into fitness and you're into um, training your body to be more, more like an athlete, Go check this guy out. Do yourself a favor. He is he is amazing. Athlean X um, on YouTube. He's he's phenomenal. But he talks a lot about pre-stretching the muscle to get a more forceful contraction. So you know, for example, if you're if you're a righty, you know you want to have your hips lined up to the forty-five degree angle to the court, and then you want to have an extra stretch across your body with your non-hitting hand. And if you did this right now, if you just take this and take your non-hitting hand and stretch it across your body, you're going to feel a really big stretch in your lats and in your hips and in your core. That's going to allow you to release the stroke um, with, with effortless power, assuming that you're not death gripping the racket, which I bet if I, if I had to give you one thing right now, just, just make sure that you're not gripping the racket too tightly and you'll instantly have more power on your strokes and then work on the technical things that that we talk about in our videos that we talk about in our courses that that will really put your body in an advantageous position to release those things um you know and, and you'll be a star maybe by monday you know wow even tuesday. we've gone from tuesday to monday that's yeah you know, we're cool. we're moving the bar <laughs> I, I like that i like that you know I, I think you also hit a big point and it's and it's why i May make a lot of tennis courses. You know why? Why I'm still on the court pretty much every day. But what I found the value in these online courses is learning how to be uh, your own tennis doctor. Is that you can because that's a big part of tennis. There's no way you're going to take a course and never make a mistake again. There's no way you're going to take a, a private lesson and never make a mistake again. But the more you're learning to diagnose, and and that's why it's good that if you have some of my courses or some of OSA Tennis 360 courses or Essential Tennis or Fuzzy Yellow Balls, or whatever, don't buy them once. I mean, don't don't look at them once. Don't like unwrap the gift like Christmas and then forget about it. Go back to it. Don't 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 feel guilty if you if you do that either. You know, if you've got some of our courses, go back and review the material. That's that's really. What they're there for is that anytime you're kind of like falling off, you can go, oh, yeah, well, I got a course on the forehand. Let me really look at that. And then I guarantee you, if it's a good course, that you're going to be able to find the answer there. And you're going to go, oh, that's what I'm doing wrong. And you want to get to a point to where every time you play and you miss a shot, you're not like going, well, I don't know why I'm not playing well. I, you know, I just stink today, you know. It's it's being able to to look at your game very non judgmentally and hit a shot and go oh well I missed the shot because of that next time I see the ball if I just do this 
And it's not even overthinking. It's like one quick tip. Next time I see the ball, if I do this, I'm going to not miss that ball wide. Or I didn't put enough pace on that. I need I need to hit the ball a little harder. If I if I do this, I will hit the ball harder next time. So that's a really, really good way to play better tennis than just going out there and going, I'm hot today. I'm not hot today. And I think that happens to all of us at some point. We're just like, oh, I feel the ball today. I'm playing great and having a great day. And you know, you just kind of accept it. And then when things aren't going well, you're just like, oh, well, I just think today, you know, this is like, why am I even out here? And if you're better at diagnosing what's going wrong for you, because there's going to be several days where you don't, you don't start out the way you want to, you're going to be able to get down 03, 04, and then start to problem solve. Those are the best players, not the people who can just go out there and, you know, start up 3 and go, oh, it's my day, you know, and then just crush somebody because, Tennis is a problem-solving game. So uh, I really want to thank you for coming on today and uh, tell us, we've gone through these top five. What happens next? What should we all be doing next with you to improve our forehand? Uh, you know, it's one of those things that it's kind of the elephant in the room, but go just go out and hit some balls. You know, give, give this a whack, but don't just go out and, and hit balls. That's not really accurate. What you want to do is have a plan. Okay. So we gave you some things that you can do today with, with your timing, like how to get your hands on the level of the ball when you're going out and you're practicing the key positions. I've got a bunch of videos on my channel that you're free to check out that are hundred percent free. That'll show you where those positions are that you need to work from. Pete's got a ton of good stuff on his channel. What you want to do is go out Pick one or two things that you want to focus on if you're going to go out to practice, if you're going out to improve your stroke, which is what we're talking about today. Because I think we also mentioned if you're playing matches, that's not the time to improve your stroke. When you're out playing matches, your focus is on what do I need to do strategically in order to, to play as well as I can. And then as Pete said, problem solve and, and fix as you need to. But if you're going out to practice your stroke, start from the point of contact. Find where that point of contact is for you and just notice what it feels like when you hit the ball and it feels really good, okay? And that's, that's where we want to start from. And then from there, we can start to work backwards. Um, and I talk about this in a new course. I just I said we're not going to pitch it. I'm not pitching this. but to um, Or maybe it is a pitch. But <laughs> It's how to make the easy forehand every time. And we talk about starting from the point of contact and then working progressively backwards to give yourself the whole picture. But go find where that point of contact is for you. And the, the video that I'm going to send to you tomorrow will show you a way that you can do that and really establish that as your go-to foundation for where your point of contact is. And that's going to allow you to um, make a lot more uh, forehands in and make tennis a lot more fun too. Very, very cool. Well, thank you so much. You know what I'm going to do in case, because you said people can still get the free train. So, you know, if you're on, if you're on, uh, our email list, and if, if you did opt in for that free cheat, cheat sheet on the forehand, you will get that video tomorrow from, from Ramon. But if you are uh, not on, on his list yet, what I'm going to do right now, if you're uh, look at the chat, and literally I just hit send. So um, you're going to see that link come up to where it's OSA Tennis 360 uh, forward slash or backslash crunch time. I always get confused on the forward slash or the backslash. Oh, I would yeah, have said forward slash. Is. You said backslash. But either yeah. rate, there's the link. Feel, feel free to get on his list so that you will get uh, a cheat sheet on the forehand. So how to build your, your perfect forehand. And then and then tomorrow, you're gonna they're going to get a video from you. Is that what's going to happen? Yeah. And by the way, thank you, Pete. Um, th there's a, I made a huge blunder <laughs> a couple days ago. And with this tech stuff, I'm, I'm about as you know, I'm like all thumbs when it comes to tech, but some people opted in and then didn't realize that there's, there's a confirmation that they have to do. And I went back and actually manually added a bunch of people who opted in that didn't get the thing. But if for some reason you opted in and you didn't get the um, cheat sheet, just go back to it today. I've, I've fixed the issue um, and it should go right into your, um, go right into your mailbox. So, um, and with that, I want to really thank you guys for, for being on this call. I hope you uh, hope you got some good stuff out of it. And Pete, thank you for for doing this, man. This is a lot of fun. It was an awesome time. I always love doing these.
I want to thank everybody on the call. And um, I, what I think we should do just before we leave, we're going we're gonna to try and end this within the next 10 minutes. Uh, but and, and right now we're up to 30 likes too, guys. And I and, uh, appreciate you guys being on. But uh, we have a couple of questions. First of all, I know it's Alan uh, Miller asked a bunch of questions. So I don't want I don't want him to lead thinking we have ignored him. So I'd like to cover his, some of his questions first. Um, Great. Let's see. Let me find one where I understand the question because I don't always understand what he's saying. Prepare early, start your swing sooner. One of the things he said was with a question mark, lead the ball, question mark. Do you remember, do you remember what you said when you said lead the ball? I think that confused him. Lead the ball. Uh, that may have been when we were talking about mirroring the ball, the flight of the ball. I think that might be what you're talking about, Alan. So it's, it's kind of one of those things I wish we were on the court together um, that I could show you. And actually, I've got a video on this. Um, if you go to, you look for, for my video on the rise, I talk about this. But it's, it's basically, here's, here's the ball. Okay, so the ball is going to have a trajectory something like this, right? It's going to leave your opponent's racket, and then it's going to come down, and then you're going to hit it, right? So, and this is our hitting hand. So what we want to do is imagine that as the ball's coming over the net, it's rising, and then simultaneously, our hand is going to start as close to we can being on the same level of, of, as the ball. So you can see my hands are, are mirroring each other. Okay, so if the ball's coming over the net in an arc, we want to think of our hand as in an arc. And what that'll do is it'll give you a, a process that you can use to improve your timing. And as I said, this doesn't always work because if the guy hits a lob, then you're going you're gonna to kind of settle under the ball, you're going to wait, and then you're going to start your loop. Or if the ball is on the way down, you're not going to start the loop at the same time. But that's kind of one process that you can use to kind of um, to go from and then correct off of that. All right, very cool. Now, this is a great question. This is a great question, and I know it's a big problem uh, for a lot because it's hard to do. So we have a question that says, I want to return a fastball, and I want to hit it back with topspin. Like, I just don't want to bunt it back. I just don't want to, you know, put my racket there and hope it goes over. I, I want to be able to take this ball that's coming in fast and look like the pros do, like like Federer was so is so great at it, and I, and, and Agassi was so awesome at it, where they they would take a fastball, uh, absorb the pace, but then you know put it back on their opponent with 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 spin and power. So, can, can you just tell us how to do that really quickly before we go? I don't know. No, <laughs> just, no just kidding. So that's yeah, that's a great question. Uh, who asked that question, by the way? All right, you you, you had to put me on the spot. Um, it's Nara Narendran. I don't know how to say it. Narendran. It, it's it's N. And so you guys are seeing how skilled I am at, at name pronunciations. It's, <laughs> it's I'm gonna give you it's how would you say N-A-R-E-N-D-R-A-N. -E and again, I apologize. I apologize. Uh he says we'll, Nareen. We'll go with Nareen. We'll go with Nareen for short. All so, right, Nareen. And she got that's a, big a great smiley. she gave us an emoji smiley face, so she doesn't hate me. Sweet. Okay. So that's a great, great question. Okay. And one of the things that you have to understand in order to, to kind of tackle this issue is you have to understand how the body is most optimally going to create power. Okay. If you have a really fast shot, the kind of the tendency is to take a big swing, at least initially, like we, we get trained to say, okay, well, the ball's coming fast, then I got to take a, you know, a big fast swing. Um, and then kind of the overcorrection of that, Noreen, is what you're talking about, which is where you just kind of bunt it back. And we don't really want to do that. What we want to do is, is have the body in a sequence of movements that allows us to um, return that shot with power. And it's kind of a complicated process. But basically, um, we're going to be using our hips. We're going to be using our creating tension in our lats. And we're going to be keeping our hands maybe a little more in front of our body. Okay, and, and people think that you have to take a big backswing to create power. You don't have to do that. As long as you can create a ton of tension in your body and you can re release it optimally, um, you can actually hit that ball with a lot, of, a lot of spin. That's why you see Federer, when he's on the dead run uh, and he doesn't have time to really set his feet, he can still create a ton of power because he's really coiled his body and he's unleashing it. He's uncoiling in, in the right process. 
So I wish we were on the court together, Noreen. I could show you exactly um, how to do this, but basically you want to you want to have your hips into the shot because people, when they bunt at it, they tend to just jab at it. They just stick their hand out, which is better than missing the shot, by the way. But but I know you want to add more power, so you want to have a little bit of hip and you want to have extension out to the ball. Oh, and this will help. The video that I'm releasing tomorrow, you can use this to deal with faster shots. I don't mention it in the video, but it is a process that you can use. Keeping your hands in front a little bit more and making sure that the point of contact is ideal. Because what tends to happen is on a faster ball, we're late, right? Or we're, we're overcompensating and we're early and we've lost that, that release of the, the stored energy um, in an ideal fashion. So make sure your contact point is right. And then play with getting extension out from your body and getting a little bit of hip into the ball. Um, and that, that should help, I hope. All right, very cool. That was great. Well, I had a lot of fun today. I hope you did too. And I hope everybody watching did. You know, it's pretty cool. Most people stayed around for the whole time, which I think is awesome. A credit to uh, people out there watching and wanting to get better. Uh, you, are, you are a rare breed. You know, I mean... That's all I can say is we go out to Harper's Point. We do a clinic. Uh, we have 24 people that usually go there, and then we go to the Western Southern Open. Uh, be looking out for that, by the way. We're going to go again. I think we've already gotten 14 people sign up. But but my point that I'm trying to make is when we go out there to this beautiful racket club, the owner of the club, Steve Cantari, says, you couldn't teach all this stuff to our members. They just want it. They just want to hit and giggle and you know hit a lot of balls and sweat. Um, so he, he said the people that like follow you online, they're a rare breed because they like to get all the nitty gritty and the detail. And, you know, let's face it, the people who really want to dive into things, they get better, whatever their potential is, whatever their full potential is. You know, we, we can't all be Roger Federer, right? I'm not Roger Federer. You know, no one on this call is Roger Federer, but we all want to feel like, Hey, I'm putting in as much as I can put in to be the best that I can be. So you being on this call today, you're taking a big step in the direction that most people are not willing to do. So you should be really, really proud of yourself. Um, and you're probably and you're probably very intelligent and good looking, just without having seen you. That's <laughs> that's probably true too. Um, so yeah, thank you guys so much for being on this call. I I had a pleasure doing this. And uh, you know, if if you're curious about kind of some of the stuff that I was talking about, make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Hop on put a new video out every week and going to be cranking out some more here pretty soon. And uh, Pete, again, thank you, man, for putting this together uh, as a pleasure. And uh, we'll do it again soon. Absolutely. Okay, guys. Well, I'm going to hit the um, stop broadcast button. I always feel like there's no smooth way to do it, kind of like pulling off a Band-Aid. It always feels a little rude. But at the <laughs> same time, I'm sure you guys don't want this broadcast to last five hours either. So I'm going to be Ending in three, two, one.